Good afternoon. Um, my name is Liam MacArthur. I'm one of the Deputy Presiding Officers here in the Scottish Parliament and a warm uh, welcome to all of you uh, to this uh, event as part of the 2023 Festival of Politics. Um, some of you will know we're celebrating our 19th uh, year of the festival, um, uh, providing um, provocative, inspiring um, and informing, uh, informative uh, debates on a range of different uh, topics. Um, we are delighted you can join us uh, today to participate in um, the session on how to disagree uh, agreeably. Uh, I was uh, remarking to somebody earlier that one or two of my colleagues can't even agree agreeably. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but I don't see any of them in the audience this, uh, this afternoon, sadly. Um, uh, we're doing this in partnership with the John uh, Smith Centre and many thanks to them for that partnership. Uh, later I will be inviting you to take part in the uh, discussion. But uh, for now, I will uh, move swiftly over to introducing our panellists. I'm pleased to say we're joined uh, by uh, Sheila Webster, uh, Peter McCall and Claire Hanna, M uh, MP. Uh, Sheila Webster is the President of the Law Society of Scotland for 2023-24 and is a partner and head of Davidson Chalmers uh, Stuart Dispute resolution team. Uh, she is described as, and I'm quoting, the Queen of Property Litigation in Scotland. A title we all aspire to, I'm sure, in some <laughs> shape or form. Uh, Peter McCall is leading uh, writer and thinker. He is the uh, Consultation Institute's senior associate in Scotland and was previously rector of the University of Edinburgh. And finally, uh, Claire Hanna MP is the SDLP spokesperson on Europe and International Affairs and sits on the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee at Westminster. I invite you to give all three panellists a warm welcome. OK, as I say, um, I'll be inviting you to, to, to join in, so please have your um, questions or comments um, uh, ready to go. But if I could maybe start um, by... Uh, just asking each of the pan panellists um, whether or not um, they would agree that we are witnessing perhaps an increased level of polarisation uh, in our political and public discourse uh, in uh, this country, perhaps more, more widely, um, and what this does in terms of, uh, of making it more difficult to, to disagree agreeably. Maybe can I start with you, Peter, and we'll move along the panel, Peter. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think it definitely does feel like there's a great deal more uh, animation in politics at the moment. It feels like people are a bit angrier, uh, that things are uh, more, more, it's more, it's more difficult uh, to have a conversation that you feel comfortable about. I'm, in some ways, I, I, in some ways, I think that's a good thing. And that's probably not what we're meant to say on this panel. But uh, I think when we look at the seriousness of the issues that are facing us, uh, you know, we've had a, a you know, really serious, I think, shock in the last six months around artificial intelligence. And there's some events later in the week on, on that. I think for a lot of us, the climate crisis is reaching a crunch point where th we have to take really serious action at this point. And that means that uh, people are... Uh, much more concerned about the issues that, 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 that we're talking about at the moment. And I, th and I think that adds to the level of energy in debate. But it makes it even more important that we debate and discuss things in a way that gets us to a resolution and doesn't get us deeper into the set of problems that we're in at the moment. So I think in some ways, uh, the first thing we need to do is recognise that there are serious issues and there are serious issues that need to be dealt with. So we, we have to acknowledge the things that are of significance to us as a society, as a world, but also we need to find ways in which we can discuss and agree on those things in a way that allows everybody uh, to feel that the right decision has been, met, has been made, not necessarily that it's one they agree with, but that it's been a process that they've followed, that they've felt uh, allowed them to, to have their viewpoint heard. And there's a, there's a concept that, that we've talked a lot about 
uh, at the Young Academy of Scotland, which is, which is called loser's consent. If you work through a process where you try to ensure that the loser will consent to the outcome, then you'll have a better process. That's not to say you shouldn't discuss serious things in a way that, uh, that, 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 that deals with the seriousness of the issues, but you should have a process where everybody feels that whatever the outcome, that they've been able to be part of that process. So I think, yes, we do have more contention, but that contention is commensurate with the seriousness of the issue. What we need to do is find ways to discuss, to talk about things, and uh, to be together in a way that, that gets us to conclusions, not that deepens uh, the schisms that, that we have. Thanks, Peter. Clear. I mean, maybe you're reflecting on some of what Peter said, but, but also that point about um, where issues become quite binary um, and it's quite easy to get entrenched, that, that point Peter was making about um, it not being a case of winner takes all, that actually there needs to be some accommodation of those who may have not necessarily won the argument, but, but can't then s simply be marginalised as a, as a result of, of, of the outcome of whether it's an election or a, or, or a, or, or a referendum or whatever it may be. <coughs> Yes, yeah. absolutely. And I think so many, so many of the big political issues have been and sort of almost existential. I mean, I'm obviously I'm a politician from Belfast and for years have lamented the state of our politics and trying to normalise things. And instead, we've just sort of ulsterized politics everywhere else <laughs> and everywhere else has become um, kind of extreme uh, and binary. And unfortunately, um, we, we do seem to be in a period where for many, and in many cases, you know, the mileage seems to be in the problem and in describing the problem and getting people all head up about the problem rather than actually coming to um, coming to a resolution. And I mean, some of um, there's there's a, an increasing kind of expertise in making issues seem uh, very life or death. No doubt, we have had very profound issues to discuss around, for example, Brexit and the, and the fissures that that's created in politics. But if you look back. It's only over a decade you were looking at contests in, in the US between Obama and McCain and you go, I, I, you know, I could live with either of those outcomes or between sort of Cameron and Brown. And, and now <coughs> it does feel to many people like, you know, the, 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 the future of everything resides on, on, on stopping somebody um, coming, coming in or coming out. And I wish there was a, a great philosophy for, for agreeing disagreeably. I suppose it's just finding the good faith actors that, uh, that, 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 that are there, as you say, and trying to build as much consensus and reassurance into the decisions that do get made. I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's held as a, as a bit of a truism that um, for all that the, the siren voices on, on the extremes are, um, are, are very visible in, in, in campaigns, are very visible through media, social media, that actually elections tend to be um, uh, won and lost on the centre ground. Do you think that's, that's now changed? I mean, you've given examples of where actually the, 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 the principal candidates um, in, in leadership roles on, 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 on both sides um, are more to the uh, more to the extreme. So, uh, have we seen a shift in that? Do you well, think? Well, in the main, actually, when you look at the nub of policy, quite often there isn't a lot of space. You know, it's classic if you're setting up an ice cream stand, you go and you set it up beside the other ice cream stand. You know, because that's where the, the the market is, and in a lot of cases, that's what's happening in politics. But where maybe the noise and the disagreement and the and the the, the fighting really is going on is on more tangential issues and I suppose what we would characterise and sometimes it's a bit simplistic as, 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 as culture war, maybe the issues that actually aren't fundamental and, and people weren't anticipating would or should be you know the, the, the core things that we need to decide on and agree on for running the region or running the country you know there, 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 there may be um, you know just issues as I say that people believe that they can get mileage on and believe that they can set a trap for their mm. for their opponent on. Yeah. Sheila you come from a background where in a sense I suppose um, uh, you agree um, or you, you disagree agreeably all the time. You're within the framework of the law. Um, you, you argue your case, but, but in a sense, um, I, everybody seems to understand the rules and all the rest of it. Is it I, I, are you sort of concerned by what you see in terms of that wider public and political discourse? I am. Uh, I'm, I'm just checking whether or not my mic is working or not. We've got a, a backup here. All right. um, but, you know, I can speak louder. Um, that's absolutely right. I think my background is as a, a litigation solicitor. That's what I've done for my entire career. Uh, so inevitably, that my job is about disagreeing. Um, I am both concerned and saddened, um, even in, in my profession, that I perceive there to be an increasing amount of disagreeable uh, 
issues, uh, just uh, the, the way people approach things, it seems, and, and I think this is probably within the last decade, that I see increasingly people personalising things in a way that is not appropriate to my mind. I mean, I, I think we do a job. Um, our job is to present a case for a client. It is not to take on that client's persona and be the client. We're not the client. We're there to represent clients and to present a case in the best possible way. And it bothers me that we see that same thing that in wider politics, both in this country and indeed across the world, uh, that that same thing is happening in our profession. That people seem to want to personalise things, which I don't think is helpful at all. Um, for me, it's about listening. Um, I think, you know, it's a bit of a cliche, but, you know, we have two ears and one mouth, and that proportion is probably appropriate. And I do question whether or not we listen well enough to people. Um, so, for me, that's, it's becoming a big problem. I think, I think it becomes difficult then to manage a case, certainly in my profession, to manage cases and manage argument. It's what we do, but you can do that in a way that doesn't become at the extremes and actually create more problems rather than try and work towards a solution. It's possible to work towards a solution and to my mind that's what we should be doing. I mean that point you make about listening, I was, uh, it's unusual to, to promote events that have taken place but, but, but indulge me, I, I, I was in conversation with Dame Evelyn Glenn um, this morning and, and she, was, she offered some really kind of thoughtful insights into how we learn to listen um, uh, much more deeply and, 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 and profoundly. And it does seem to, to be the case that a lot of the debates we have now are about the exchanges of preconceived ideas as opposed to responding to the nuance or the detail of the argument that's being, being put to you by the other side, other than um, the kind of anticipation of what the argument would be and therefore the kind of pre-prepared um, response lines to that. I mean, I, I, how, how do we kind of move away from that to, to, to uh, sort of inculcate a greater um, sense of, of, of importance in that act of listening as well as um, uh, communication? I think we have to recognise that uh, the language we use can be a huge influence on that. Um, you know, I was reading an article um, by someone who's very well known in this field, John Stullock, um, who wrote an article, uh, and you can find it on his website, it was a letter to our First Minister when he took over at the end of March, and he talks about if we approach things as an opportunity rather than as a threat, and, the la and, and if your language reflects that, you know, how can we fix this rather than here's my thought and can I just tell you why I'm right and you're wrong. If you approach things in that way, then it seems to me that if we, if we start by recognising that we have the language that we use in politics and elsewhere and in the world generally, and one only has to think of Twitter or X, whether you've given over to the X name or not, I'm not, I'm sticking with Twitter. Um, but uh, if you, you know, if, I think if you think about that and the kind of language we see on there, is that really listening? And how are we, if we, if we approach it as a threat and an accusatorial language, then this will, this situation we're in just now, and I, you know, I don't in any way step away from what Claire and Peter have said. There are some huge issues before us all in the world, in politics, and, and even just day-to-day -day life. There are so many things that are really controversial and that we do need to face head on. But do we have to do that in an accusatorial, threatening way? Because that is unlikely to find a solution and to be able to build on that for all of us to try and come to solutions. You know, I'm no expert in climate change and I don't wish to suggest that I am, but those that are, um, you know, it, it is clearly something we have to think about. We have to address this now. Um, but we're not going to do that if all we're doing is throwing brickbats and over the counter at each other. That's not going to find a way that we can all agree as to how we can improve the situation the world is in and the challenges we face. Mm -hmm. I mean, you quote John Sturrock there. I mean, his background is obviously mediation, arbitration, and, and things like that, which is, I suppose, the, the, the art of, of trying to broker agreement. So you're, you're hunting down the areas of, of, of agreement rather than amplifying the areas of disagreement. I mean, is that, is that something we need to do more? A absolutely, and, and, and give people space, and I suppose to the extent that it's possible, give, give people wins. I mean, in, in terms of Obviously, you know, this year, in the last few months, we've been celebrating a quarter of a century of the Good Friday Agreement. And one of the, the mantras, one of the lead negotiators, Seamus Mallon, you said, you know, you've got to make sure that 
others have their bus fare home basically that people have something that you're not annihilating somebody in the argument that that in that case when you're trying that was a classic example of trying to get as many people on the same page as possible imperfectly <laughs> but if you scalp people utterly uh, and leave it so that they have nothing to go back to their support uh, base uh, base with but yes absolutely because that's the thing you, you know you, you you work in the common ground not everybody in 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 most places is going to have exactly the same worldview, but fundamentally, and fundamentally most people in, in politics, which is obviously the, the area I'm operating in, have gone into it for honourable reasons and are, 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 are seeking to do the best by the people they represent, you know, by their own lights, you know, in, in terms of the way, the, way, the way that they see it. And actually, so many, it is, it is actually almost easier sometimes to find a consensual um, position and not to be chasing the bit where you can catch, catch each other out, um, what, 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 one or other. But I suppose it is, you were saying, Sheila, about just people, n not a sense that there is a, a, an effort to persuade because it's almost seen as a failure to, to change. You know, ooh, you didn't say that last year, you had a, you had a different position. Uh, it's almost seen as a failure if you say, well, actually, you know, in the compromised position, I've realised that actually, you know, it, it makes sense to do um, X, Y, or Z. But uh, you know, it is it is perfectly possible, and sometimes some of the, the much bigger issues do manage to get resolved in that in that fashion. Yeah. No, it's interesting you made that point about having your bus fare home. I remember. Or the arse in your trousers, actually, was the way you used to, you used to put it. I was, I was using the, the nicer version. Yeah, I'm sure I, 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 was, I was certain I would be able to lure that out of you. But, I mean, the other, th the other thing I've heard described was that um, actually avoiding a situation where any, any of the participants were seen to be too elated with the outcome. So yes. having too much bu bus fare um, to, get them, uh, to get them home was almost a, a problem as well. I mean, the, that point, um, Peter, about um, personalising the debate. I mean, we, I confess we see that quite a bit here where, in a sense, you're, you're, you're playing the man, not the ball, and, and you're not engaging necessarily with the nuance of the, or even the broad sweep of the issue. You're actually just looking to take out um, the, 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 the participant. I mean, is that, is that something you've seen get worse? I mean, it's clearly not helpful in terms of finding a way to disagree agreeably. I, mean, I, I think there's an, there's an interesting thing here, which is about the structure of rewards. Uh, and the reason why people behave in the way in which they behave is sometimes because they can't control themselves. But very often it's because of the rewards that are set out for particular ways of behaving. And uh, I mean, the, the, the chamber here is set out so that you're not really meant to be able to shout at one another. Uh, <laughs> People do really do manage it, and I mean, I mean it's, it's taken on some of the characteristics of confrontational parliaments, where you know you're you're separated by is it two sword widths, um, and uh, and and the reason why that that happens is because if you want to get on the evening news then what you do is you come up with a zinger and you hit your opponent with that and you'll, and, and you'll have that reported. The structure of reward, which is you, you get attention and you get profile, is around who is making the most controversial statement. And I think uh, for all sorts of reasons, Donald Trump has been able to, um, I, I don't like the word hack, but he's been able to hack the system so that he gets so much attention for what he says and what he does that nobody else can get any oxygen in the room. And, the, and, and what we need to do is start structuring our rewards so that we don't reward that sort of behavior. If there are sanctions for that sort of behavior instead of rewards, then I think you will begin to see behaviors changing because if you reward people like that, you end up with everybody getting pulled into that same model of behaviour and you end up with a downward spiral. And I, and I think that's, that's really what, what, what's happened and that's, that's how we end up in this situation. And I mean, I think US politics has ended up with it in an, in a, in an, almost, uh, in an almost caricature <laughs> of, that sort of that sort of policy. I mean, I mean, you get people to talk about disagreement in politics and of course you end up with two people from Belfast. Um, <laughs> uh, but I, I mean, the, you know, the Ulster of politics elsewhere, I, I mean, I don't think it's anything to do with Ulster at all. Well, I mean, other than the foundation of the United States, but we'll maybe come back to that later. 
Um, but uh, but I mean, I think American politics has ended up in that in that in that very polarized position because of the structure of of those of those rewards. You get more attention, you get more media time. If you say something that's that's completely out there, people will report it. It'll be exciting. And I, I mean, Liam, you, you suggested that elections were one in the middle, and I think I think actually elections are one in two different places. They're, sometimes they're one in the middle, but sometimes they're one by energising people uh, in, in different spaces. And I think that's that was the thing that Donald Trump unlocked. He didn't go anywhere near the middle ground. So the, the Republicans had a review after the 2012 election where they said, we need to appeal to a wider range of voters. And Donald Trump said, I'm not going to appeal to a wider range of voters. I'm going to excite a narrower range of voters. And that was very successful for him. And that's that. Th there's a reward there. Um, now, he does it on things that I profoundly disagree with. It's not to say that you couldn't do that about things that might not be a bad thing, you know. At, at times, there, there there might be things that you would want to excite voters around, but if you structure your rewards around that excitement, then that's what you will get. And that and that I think is where we've ended up politically is is around uh, issues of high resonance and and people really exploiting those issues in a way that um, is often problematic. And I mean. I remember very clearly the 2017 local authority elections in Scotland, which ended up being about uh, your position on the union. Now, that wasn't really the question that was at hand, and it was very difficult to get the question at hand on, onto people's minds. Uh, so it's a, it's a question not just for people sitting in the presiding officer's chair. I think it's a, you know, a question for, for all of us. How do we focus our politics on the things that really are the question being put rather than on what gets you excited? And I, and I think there's a, there's a level of discipline there. There's just one final thing I'd, I'd want to say about this, which is that I think very often we do debate like running for the bus when you don't do any other exercise. Uh, we only do debate where we absolutely need to do it. So we only do it on things that we really, really care about. We very rarely debate things that we don't care about. So we don't get the practice of understanding what it's like to lose on something you don't care about. And I think very often, it, I, I think we need to do more of that. And one of the things that the Academy of Scotland has been involved in is debating in schools that's not on the old debating model, but that's on a, uh, on a debating model that does create those, those rewards around more reasoned debate and actually addressing the issue at hand. And I think we need to do more of that, not just in schools, but, but as a society. We need to do more play debating, more, more talking about how we might disagree about things. We, we were, believe it or not, we were talking about Harry Styles before we came in here. Um, <laughs> Talking more about what you do or don't like Harry Styles might be a really useful thing in helping us to understand the structure of debate and what you can do in debate to try and win, win other people over in a reasonable way. Would you find people who don't like him, though, to participate in that? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we could. Can I just put on the record that I was excluded from that debate? Clearly, my views on Harry Styles were seen as beyond the, beyond the pale. Um, no, I, 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 your point about the horseshoe um, chamber is, 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 is absolutely correct. I mean, you can be pretty hostile to somebody that's sitting behind you, um, believe it or not. And, and, and interestingly, actually, some of those who, as you say, in terms of that reward, can be most aggressive in the way they put across their argument, are often the ones that are quickest to complain um, when, the, when the tables are turned and, and, and they become the, the, the subject of that more uh, aggressive uh, behaviour. Right, we've warmed you up sufficiently. I think that we can, uh, we can open the floor to uh, questions and comments. If you could maybe keep them um, relatively brief, um, then we can get through more of them. We have a roving mic. Um, which is being waved around in the air. So if you stick up your hand and I'll point to you and wait for the mic um, and then fire on. So the lady there in the middle, middle row, yeah. Hi, um, is the genie out of the bottle? Is there any way to go back from this highly adversarial approach that we have in politics now? Claire, going to come to you first with that. I think there is, but we really we do have to change our behaviours, and, and it's right, it, it, it's it's correct that you're rewarded for the job and 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 kind of, and I know that yourself. You post something on Twitter, um, and it's you know a nice nuanced points that you've made about some aspect of public services, and nobody cares. But if you sort of 
own somebody else in the chamber, the, the likes and the retweets. So we do, I think that's a very good point about, about uh, changing um, the rewards. And I think we have to force some of that nuance back into debate. And maybe some of that is around broadcasters as well, to the extent that people are still consuming their media in that way, to sort of be a little bit more forceful and saying, I'm going to take a minute to, to set this out, you know, in rather than being some of the programmes being set up, right, I'm going to put these two cats in a bag and, and let you go. And I think it, to the extent that people who are participating in the programmes do cooperate and pushing back on that and not always take the bait and not always kind of savagely go after the person, the presenter wants you um, to, to go back. But it is difficult because actually all of us as, as electors as well have an insatiable demand for, for simple answers. Uh, for people, we all we all want things to be presented to us in a thirty-second soundbite. Uh, we all want to know that there is a you know nobody really wants to hear that actually this is quite a wicked problem and it's going to take uh, you know we're not all going to get um, all that we want. So it is sometimes it does feel that it's slipping further and further away. And if you look at other places, if we were talking about US, where where, where there appears you know a real. Um, uh, you know, like has slipped into a very conspiratorial place in terms of the politics. You wonder how on earth um, that will ever be. I'm not answering this. I promise. I'm putting it on do not disturb as I should have done. Um, <laughs> you're, 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 you know, how, how will that ever get back into that place? But I think it does just. It takes people to to take their role seriously as 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 kind of policy makers and and contributing to the public debate and not trolls essentially in 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 the, in the public arena. Yeah. Sheila, are you uh, an optimist? Do you think the genie can be put back in the bottle? Do you think there's an appetite, um, genuinely, then, to, to see that happen? I believe we have to make that appetite. I, I agree with a lot of what Claire says. That I think the difficulty that we have, I'm particularly concerned about the younger members of our society, children, uh, and the appalling... I mean, Twitter's a, an example, but it's not the only thing. Uh, they are being taught, it seems to me, possibly without us thinking that we're teaching them, but we are teaching them that that is an acceptable way to behave. And there are so many examples out there, and I mean, we'll all be reading the press and you read the stories of children who have done some really terrible things to themselves because somebody is using Twitter as a weapon against them. And, and that kind of thing cannot go on. We're letting our children down. If we allow that to continue, we have to do something about this. I, I mean, I think the last time I was with Liam was in relation to a debate that uh, the, the Law Society of Scotland sponsors. Um, one of our things that we do in outreach is to work to sponsor a, a debating competition called the Donald Dewar Debating Competition every year. And the, uh, the final two years ago, the children are amazing. They, you know, the, their ability to debate at really quite young ages is absolutely astounding and it gives me great hope for the future. But equally, I remember that night there were some really fairly ghastly things said about a very famous author, you can guess who. Um, and I, I found it really quite frightening that these children who were around, you know, somewhere between sort of 12 and 16, were prepared to say things out loud. And they clearly thought that was an acceptable way to present an argument. And you're going, where's the I mean, I debated at school, I debated at university. We were taught to persuade, not to just shout abuse at the other side. And I think we're letting those, that group of children down if we continue to behave in a way as adults that demonstrates that that's an acceptable way to behave. So I have hope that we can do something about that. I think we have to look deep as adults at our own behaviours and what we are teaching that our youngsters to believe is an acceptable way to behave. I think it's terribly important that we all recognise uh, as an adult society what we're doing and whether or not this, what it's going to do. Because if we don't stop it now, these children are going to grow up to be adults and they're going to believe that this is the way and they're going to teach their adults. And then, then I have no hope and I don't want to believe that. I believe that actually we need to really work very hard as a society to stop and think about whether this is the way to persuade people. People, you know, all the things that, that, that Peter was talking about, about rewards, all of that's absolutely right. We have to try and understand that, you know, people need to leave. And 
I'm a mediator as, as well as, a, as, as a, a, a lawyer, a court lawyer, and you know, the difference that one can make to a dispute, if you can work towards that middle ground to try and understand that yes, you want X, Y, Z, but they want A, B, C. So what can we do to try and get to that middle ground where we both get something out of it? Because if we both, okay, you'll both probably walk away slightly unhappy, but there's a difference between slightly unhappy and absolutely at daggers drawn and never deal with the other one again. The, the reference to property litigation, for me, that's a big part of my career. The difficulty is if you're going to have a relationship between say a landlord and a tenant, which continues, how is it helpful to get to a point where we're all screaming at each other, they hate each other and they're just looking for the next debate? Is it not much more important that we try to pull them together so that there's a bit of a win on each side, there is a reward for each side of some sort, a recognition that we have to change whatever it is in our relationship to make it work better. And I see it, if it's done properly, it works. And you can go on to, so, to watch that relationship between say landlord and tenant grow. I can see that happen. It absolutely works if we work at it. But if you go in and if Mr. Sturrock were here, he would tell you that you know, don't go in with a bottom line. It's not helpful. <laughs> go in with an open mind to listen to the other side and to work out what you can do to get something in the middle that works for both of you. It might not be perfect for either of you, but if you have a continuing relationship, then that is going to be important. That's a big part of the problem, yeah. if you don't mind me just cutting in, is that in politics and in media, in, there isn't a mediator, facilitator, there isn't somebody who is trying to seek consensus, basically. And it, it, is, it is set up to be, as, as, you, as you put it, um, winner takes all. And, in, and again, sorry to keep bringing it back, it's just the experience that I've in, in Northern Ireland, when we hit a thorny problem, we do always go, we need an international mediator, and it does. That's that's where you somebody who whose job it is to go right. I'll, I'll collect that bit up. You know, you all seem to agree on that and to capture it. Whereas that doesn't really exist, in, and even in a, as a presiding officer, that that maybe is, is what people perceive the role might be, but that's not what the role is to sort of to, to sort of broaden out and find the ground um, that people. Are. So so building those back in because if you, you can have them in you know a judge or in a mediator. Uh, T type 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 role we need to I suppose and we used to have those in terms of you know the global order there used to be bodies and organizations who were designed to to bring people together and 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 to to create um consensus and and I suppose the degradation of those and the lack of respect for them but but they don't we need to build them into more parts of, of public life where we can yeah. I mean that that Sort of presiding officer function within the parliament, it'll be similar. Um, the, the, the speaker in the House of Commons um, is, is trying to make sure the debate remains within yeah. um, the, the broad parameters <laughs> of being been, but, but <laughs> <laughs> gouging uh, or using your sword. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it is about uh, generally a, 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 ref, a respectful tone. Yeah. But, but the assessment of what constitutes respectful is going to vary from, from parliamentarian to, 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 to parliamentarian. We don't have um, a list of prescribed, uh, proscribed um, uh, language mm -hmm. terms. Um, but, but in a sense, it, even within that broad framework, um, there can be some very, very heated exchanges, which are, um, as, as, as you were saying, geared towards um, the, the, the social media clip or the, or, or the broadcast media um, uh, clip. I, that point about um, the, the way in which social media has maybe coarsened the, um, the, the, the debate, I mean, it was, it was long held that people would behave in a, in a social media context in a way that they would never behave if they were in front of you in a, in a public meeting or in a one-to-one -one, um, in, encounter. I'm not sure that's as true now as it was. I, I, is, there, is there a sense that actually what social media has allowed to happen is a, is a kind of radicalisation of, of what is acceptable that is now manifesting itself back into those face-to-face -face, um, uh, encounters and, uh, and engagements, Peter. Uh, so, I mean, a big part of the, the project on responsible debate that I've been, been involved in was, was looking at the role of social media in, in this. And we had, a, we had a, a person who came in and talked to us, a guy called Kai Turnbull, who'd set up his own uh, website called Ch Change My View. Uh, and I found it fascinating, I found it slightly tragic that he couldn't make any money doing that. 
Uh, it went out of business uh, just about the point that Twitter was being bought for, I think it was 44 billion US dollars. And Twitter is structured in such a way that it amplifies effectively the loudest voice in the room uh, and the person saying the most unreasonable thing. And it remains something of a mystery to me why so many people are still on Twitter, why people were on Twitter. I'm on Twitter, I'm so um, <laughs> do, as, do, as, do as I say, not as I do. But, but I, I, I think there's a really interesting, the, the thing is, is structured around disagreement, around uh, you making outrageous statements, and that's what you get rewarded for. You do not get rewarded for reason debate or for persuasion or for helping to change somebody's mind. Now, I think that this is a little bit like a child who's discovered uh, refined sugar. Uh, it's, it feels absolutely fantastic and you can get, you, I mean, you, I'm quite sure that the neurological uh, parallels between taking a lot of sugar and uh, having your tweet retweeted a lot of times uh, approvingly are, are very similar. And I, I think part of the problem is that, uh, part, part of my optimism in this actually is that people do realise that taking a lot of sugar is probably not a great thing for you to do and they learn not to do that. And I think we as a society need to learn uh, not to go for the sugar rush of uh, that, that outrageous statement that I got wound up by is fantastic. And the person trying to have a reason to debate is somebody I'm just going to ignore. And I, and I think as a society, we, we need to take coll a collective decision uh, to not uh, allow ourselves to be wound up by this, to not be the, the slave of our passions in this way. And, and, I, and I think that's, that's, that's where the optimism for me lies, is that we're being exposed to this. We weren't exposed to it before, and therefore it wasn't, it was like society before we learned how to refine sugar. Uh, we now have to understand what, what, what this is going to do to us. It's going to rot our teeth and it's going to make us fat. And that's, that's really problematic. And, and, we, and we need to find ways uh, to debate things without that invective. That's not to say that the issues shouldn't be seriously debated. And I think part of my issue with some of the debate around this is that everybody going into the room and agreeing with one another is not a responsible debate. It's not uh, a, a, a disagreeing agreeably. We need to be able to continue disagreeing. We need to be able to continue having uh, arguments with one another, but we need to do it in a way where we're not coming out uh, thinking the other person has lost their humanity in this, and, and that, that's for me what's really important. Can I just say that the BSL interpretation of Twitter as a sugar rush is a bit addictive as well. I have to <laughs> <laughs> find myself drawn. Uh, we've got a couple of questions in the um, front row and then the, and then the second row there. Start with the gentleman in the front row. Yeah, um, hi guys, my name's Bryce Goodall, um, pronounce he him. Um, I'm neurodivergent, neurodiversion, as somebody who's got dis a disability. It's really quite difficult to cut through knowing basically, like, to get, to really, to get some, like, authoritative, like, and really to get some, going through a decision making process is quite difficult for me. And I think that, um, just to touch upon what Peter was saying about like social media, I think that what I have seen within, because I work in social media communications and stuff like that, and in politics, and what I've seen is there is a huge emphasis on basically likes, follows, influencers, and it's and there is actually some the, the going back to the science. One of the scientific things we found out from a research, a research was that. Facebook, um, there's a new study coming out, but I don't really know how, how good that is, but I think the previous study was much more peer-reviewed, was it said it had the similar effects of crack cocaine on the brain. And it was such an addictive an addictive space because it was, it was, it was fermenting with anger and all that. And I think I'd like to ask is that, I, and also I've come from an experience as a climate justice activist, is that I've been in spaces like Climate Camp Scotland, where basically there's like a consensus-based decision-making process, where basically it works much more collegiately, much more, it works to, works to effectively get to a good decision. And I just want to ask is, I think, on the parliamentarians who are in the room here today, is that I think 
I'd like to ask, where would you like to see social media on, 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 on how do we get to that point of regulating that? Because the problem is, is that when Instagram, for example, where before it became taken over by Meta, was Instagram actually um, was going to take the likes function off it basically to try and be able to try and to try and dilute that power and try and do that. And there was some popular figure like Nicki Minaj, for example, who said that she would remove herself completely off that platform because she needed that likes, she needed that uh, that 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 that, that uh, social currency, and she needed to see the followers and stuff like that. And I think that's really difficult. When you've got these big figures who are trying to who are trying to remove them, who are just who are going to who are going to boycott a platform of that, and to the laws, I think that can we look to see if we can be able to make like the process of law less adversarial within the courtroom and more inquisitorial. Because I read, for example, the book by the secret barrister, and I found out how the law is broken in England and Wales. And I think it's so important. How can we look to try and be able to get a model where access to justice and access to, to really to get that process which you're talking about more accessible especially for disabled people like myself because as somebody who's disabled I need to have a, I, can, I find navigating the law quite difficult so I think that that is something I just want to lay my lay, lay my plane on there I just want to know I just really want to know what was the one direction of 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 the Harry Styles debate? By the way, I want I want I want to know I want to know what, what, what happened. What Thank goes on much. in the green room stays in the green room. <laughs> I mean, we've come to you, Claire, in terms of that regulation around social media. I mean, it, yeah. it's something we've wrestled with and nobody really has come up with no, a, a satisfactory solution. No, absolutely not. And there's a piece of legislation going through the Westminster yeah. at the moment. It's become, you know, unwieldy because yeah. we were trying to do lots of things. Social media, in, in a lot of ways, that's a very interesting concept about it coming back up the pipe. And, and mm. I, I do recognise that. But it's almost, you know, the way people are behind the wheel and they're like, in the horn. Whereas if you actually... You know, if you sort of nearly bumped into somebody on the road, you'd both be like, "Sorry, sorry." You know, if you're if you're in if you're in person, but somehow people change their personality entirely when they're when they're in a car, and some people are doing that in uh, in social media. And I had an experience quite recently. I was at a, just a community meeting about a relatively minor issue, and um, I was making a point about a planning issue, and somebody actually made a horrific, very aggressive, you know, counter, you know, very I thought quite <coughs> overblown. And I was really taken aback and I thought, you know, this is this is us falling out for life. And then you meet the person something else. I met her two weeks later. She's like, hello. And people just that's maybe how people perceive that they're supposed to perform. That's how you 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 express your opposition. You know, express it in very extreme and, ass and assertive ways in terms of the in terms of the regulation. It's going to be very difficult to get right. I think the first priority is protection of, I suppose, young people and maybe people where they, where they are at their most vulnerable sometimes in terms of uh, exposure to to very harmful content. There's a wider conversation as well about about m media literacy and and social media literacy and and encouraging, particularly from a very young age, people to understand you know what's real and what's not real, and also how you um, d discern kind of good content um, fr from bad. But I suppose it is unhacking the algorithm in the way you talked about Donald Trump being able to figure out how to push buttons and, and feed people stuff that will either enrage them or excite them. But it is just a fact, and you can see it happening on the platform formerly known as Twitter at, at, the, at the moment, that um, some, you know, the most, the most uh, you know, in this for you, I mean, anybody who does use this, the content that's being served to you, you're like, what made you think I would be interested in this? And there's lots and lots of evidence. And um, that whistleblower who, who spoke in Congress about basically in Facebook, within two or three clicks, you can you know get people to very radical content if they if they maybe look at a page that has some divergent view on something like COVID or whatever. You you then get served something that's you know kind of virulently and that's the wrong word, but aggressively anti-vax. And the next thing they're getting cute and on stuff very very quickly. So I suppose you know regulation of that. How we do it? I'm I'm not I'm not tech. Uh, savvy enough, but I think it is, as I say, protection from uh, content, media literacy, 
legacy, but it is all of us trying to, uh, and I know myself, when you're, when you're putting out uh, tweets, or you're looking at tweets that have hundreds of retweets, and you kind of go, I'd like to get in on that action. But the only way to get in on that action is to say something, you know, ideologically pure and completely true that will resonate fully with, with one group of people when actually you need to, you know, use it to try and move a debate on a wee bit or to sort of, as I say, all of us in a role to kind of educate and deepen our, each other's uh, on understanding. So it does, as Peter said, we have, as a society have to decide um, to use it better. But I tell you, those companies have a tremendous power in our lives. You know, we talk about this digital town square and it really, truly is. Because if you think of something like Twitter, where many of us in, in, in these lines of work do spend a lot of time and you think, you know, I hate it, but I don't know what to do without it. And the fact that um, really, uh, you know, quite quite mendacious actors actually just basically somebody who has the dough can can control um, really what has become the platform um, for for a lot of information and, and public bodies are saying, well, check Twitter for updates or whatever, or having to drive people to this platform that is in um, hands that you know aren't entirely. Um, uh, aren't entirely high-minded is, is very very concerning and and the only way that we do do it is is is, is to regulate and i think the european union are, are are kind of leading on a lot of that and really have the type of legislators who are prepared to spend days getting you know in on in on the algorithm but we all have our own responsibilities as well i, I sometimes feel my biggest problem with the algorithm is since i hit my um mid 50s it just bombards me with adverts for weight loss and orthopedic shoes um, <laughs> I probably need, but I don't need reminded. Um, I, I, the gentleman in the second row, I think, maybe we will come back to, to the panel. Um, hi. So we're here talking about, you know, disagreeing agreeably, and we're here with the John Smith Centre, which pr promotes trust in politics and public service. How do you think the current discourse of political debate affects trust in politics, but also people's decision to take part in public service more broadly, let alone politics itself? Yeah, very good question. Can I start with you, maybe, Peter, on that? Yeah, I, I, I think there's, there's a really interesting thing here in the broad movement across Europe. Uh, and I'm going to make a political point here, which is I think there are some people for whom it is advantageous if, if most people opt out of politics. So the worse you can make politics, the more undesirable you can make the debate, the more personal you can make it, the more unpleasant you can make it, the better it is for them. And that is, that is hugely problematic. And I, think, and I think that's something that we see in a lot of debate. Uh, and I mean, I think it's, you know, I think it's the Donald Trump uh, approach is make politics so unpleasant that people who want to achieve change around issues that they believe to be important don't consider this to be a place that they want to be. And the problem is that we don't have anywhere else to disagree on things. And I, and I mean, a point I'm, I often make to, to people is that if there were a way to resolve something in another way, we wouldn't end up discussing it in politics. Those are not the issues you discuss in politics. The issues you discuss in politics are the issues you can't agree on. Uh, and people then say, oh, but why are you always disagreeing? Why are politicians always disagreeing with one another? Well, it's because it's, that's the place where those issues go to be resolved, by definition. And, and then some people will come along, come along and say, well, they all disagree with one another. Can't they just all get along together? And, and there's, there's, a, there's a real attack on politics and on the space of collective decision making. And I think that's, that's, that's one of the greatest threats to our society at the moment, because we can't decide together about where we go in future, then we have an absolutely massive problem. Uh, and it's people with other bases of power who are making that, uh, m m making, make it, creating that situation. And it's something that I'm really conscious that what I've said is that uh, you, that we need to go and do things, uh, and that the only way in which we can deal with these things is not really through regulation. I think it's really difficult to regulate on uh, social media, and you know I've thought a lot about what you would do, and there isn't really much you can do uh, other than taking ownership out of the hands of um, idiots. Uh, and, and I think I think we all know who I'm talking about there. Um, I find it absolutely hilarious that Elon Musk thinks his app is going to be where people do their financial transactions after his antics. I mean, I wouldn't trust the man with my money ever. Um, but so, so I think I think there's there's something around uh, making sure that we find spaces to discuss things. And there's and there's something, and when it comes back to the Scottish Parliament, I, I find it fascinating that it's First Minister's questions that gets broadcast every week. And First Minister's Questions teaches you almost nothing about anything. 
Uh, and yet there are committee hearings uh, for much of the rest of the parliamentary week in which if you pay attention, you can learn an awful lot. That's, that's where the actual work of parliament happens and that's where people become expert around things. And is the broadcast media interested in, in it? Not really. And I think what we need to do is find the space where, where we can have discussion of those issues that people know things about, that people are interested in, where they share in, information and, and knowledge and expertise, and, and we get to resolution on some of those issues rather than uh, the bish bosh of uh, uh, First Minister's questions, Prime Minister's questions, that, that sort of very confrontational politics, which as anyone who's been watching this parliament or other parliaments for, for, for any number of years will know, achieves almost nothing. I, I, had, I, learned, I didn't realise that I wasn't a big parliament watcher before I was elected, and I didn't realise that those aren't exchanges of information. No. <laughs> you're not going to ask a minister. You're not actually trying to extract. You're like writing a little vignette. You're trying to, you're trying to <coughs> write a little mini play or something almost, because I remember going well, I could ask, and they were like, somebody else said, no, you ask that in a written question. What you want is to, and it is, you're almost trying to entrap them or you, you, you're trying to cram as much into your, your sentence. And it is, it's, it's entirely unproductive. You know, and it's, it's the bane of the presiding officer's life, that, those yeah. preambles, <laughs> let me tell yes. you. Um, let me no, just that, make 17 quick points uh, before <laughs> I go into my <laughs> it's the, uh, Yes, it's the number of sub-clauses to any one, <laughs> in one particular question that, that um, I think really gets the goat. I, at that point about trust and actually who it's, it's um, either leaving uh, within politics but within public life more, more generally or those that it's attracting in. I mean, are, are, you, are you seeing that in terms of, of, of your own profession, in terms of the roles that, that people are prepared to, to, to take, that it's, it's too much hassle to be um, a kind of a, a target for the sorts of, 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 of abuse or attacks that uh, you're likely to take in, in those leadership roles? I think it is. It's quite interesting that uh, it's something that we've been talking about, just social chit-chat in, in my office, about why has politics got to this stage? Why have we got too many, not all, but too many politicians who appear to have whether it's deliberate or not, I don't know. I have a feeling, sadly, that Peter is right and it may be deliberate. But why, why have all the politicians that we respected when I was growing up, and I'm obviously old, but, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, people coming into politics seemed to want to provide public service, to do public service. I'm no longer convinced that is the primary objective of some. And I think one, without naming names, one can look at perhaps south of the border at one particular politician who appears to have forgotten where the constituency that they represent, and I'm not giving away who that is, but you know, there is, they seem to have forgotten where it is. Um, if the papers, press is to be uh, believed, and I, you know, there's a big caveat there, but you know, if the press is to be believed, there is an issue. Why are people going into politics? It, it really, slightly scares me that uh, politics does seem to be somewhere where people are going in too often for their own benefit rather than for public service. If and I could flip that back, I mean, because uh -huh. it's, often, it's often said, um, but actually if you look back through history, some of those that we um, respect enormously and, and, and um, across the kind of political <laughs> spectrum, were in their private lives and, and to some extent in their political public lives, absolute bloody scoundrels, uh -huh. um, but actually the level of scrutiny um, of, the, of, of, of their actions um, was considerably less than it is at the moment in a 24-hour in a um, mm. uh, media environment yeah. and in a social media age. Mm -hmm. Actually, m much more of that um, hinterland is, uh -huh. is laid bare. Is, 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 is part of that the, the, the problem rather than necessarily the, the makeup of, of, of politicians changing? I, I think it might be. Um, I mean, I think we seem to have lost a little of our ability to build trust between politicians and the public. Generally, there just appears to be something is missing. It could well be back to social media as the problem, and I have no more solution than anyone else to how do we regulate it other than through our own behaviours. Um, but I do think, because I mean, it, it seems to me it does need regulation, but I don't think I have any clever answers to that any more than anyone else does. But it does worry me. But I think, you know, I'm just thinking as people were talking there about my own profession um, and watching two different people, um, both of whom 
I view with some respect, one of them's me. Um, but uh, the, the, I watched two people and they're very different reactions. As president of the Law Society, since I became vice president, I am on Twitter. Um, I don't tweet very often. I tend to use my Twitter feed now to more promote things that the Law Society is, is doing and things like that. And that's probably one of the only reasons that I don't just come off the thing, because otherwise I regard it as pretty toxic. But uh, my equivalent as uh, leader of the advocates in Scotland, the other half of the legal profession, and there's more than that, but let's just keep it simple, the two halves, the solicitor profession and the advocates profession. Um, the advocates, uh, led by uh, the very learned Dean of Faculty, Roddy Dunlop, he has gone out there and, and fought some of the nonsense on Twitter. Um, you know, so when people come out with truly outrageous things, he challenges them. He's prepared to go out and say, no, no, no. And he's quite willing to get involved in what I would call Twitter spats. And that frightens me. I mean, the thought of, and why would I want to do that? Why is that helpful for me, for the profession? I just don't understand why I want to do that. But, but it means that we are on two completely different levels. Now, I wonder, why is it that I don't? And I think that is because I have a slight concern about putting my personal life in any way in, in public. You know, I, I have a professional role to play, but I don't want to involve my personal life in that. So I step back. Others with a different view will step forward. But unfortunately, I think more and more of us are sort of looking at, at my kind of position and saying, do I really want to do that? And that will mean less people come forward. That's going to be true in the legal profession, but it's going to be true in so many other professions, including in Importantly, given the role politicians have in all our lives, politics. If people don't want to put themselves out there as a target for whatever troll wants to have a go at them, people will not want to come forward. And I, I just think you, I mean, I don't know what that says about the difference between Roddy and I, but, you know, I wouldn't put myself forward the way he's willing to do. But that's quite a big ask to put yourself out there and have people, you know, throwing things at you on Twitter or otherwise. It, I just wouldn't want to, I don't want my face that well known. I don't feel that that's helpful for anything. I have to think about my own family and my own life. And, and it, it, if it's not going to benefit my profession and the role I have, then I won't want to do it. And I'm sure there must be a whole lot of other people in, who would otherwise have put themselves forward for public service who would feel the same way. And that, you know, to that extent, I really admire those that are prepared to put themselves into politics and to, you know, put their lives on the line a little bit. It's, uh, I think it's just sad we seem to have lost the trust. Um, because I think people put themselves out a lot to do the jobs they do in public service and it's, it's sad that people are now stopping themselves doing that because of fear about what that might involve for them personally. There is a third way between you and Roddy and I've, I've, I've hit upon it. You, you get yourself a Springer Spaniel and then you put up a canine shield between you and the rest of the social media world. It, 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 it's a fail safe. Right, uh, got time for a few more questions need to be reasonably quick and I'll probably only go to maybe one possibly two panelists um, I'll start with the gentleman there in the red and um, grey shirt thank you uh, you've talked a lot about trust and I don't know whether it just feels uh, that we're in an era of much less trust in politics than we have been before but um, you know one, what Peter talked about loser's consent. It's very difficult to consent to things that you don't agree with when there's been a whole load of lies uh, in, the, in the argument. Um, I'm thinking about the Brexit bus with the, you know, how much millions for the NHS every day. And the day after the referendum, I remember hearing Nigel Farage saying, well, nobody that wasn't true, nobody really believed it. Yet the media continue to interview politicians standing in front of that bus. So how do we how do we deal with these bad actors that lie to us if we're if if we're not to get upset and angry about the outcome? Okay, Peter, you lobbed that one out there, so you deal with that one. Uh, so I, I think loser's consent is something that participants in a debate need need to be aware of. And I think actually uh, the people who advocated for Brexit are a great example of what happens if you don't think about that when you proceed through uh, an argument. I don't think there was very much thought given to what might happen if they won and how they might reconcile themselves to people who uh, didn't agree with them. So, I, so I, th I, think, I think that's really important. For me, one of the really big things 
I still haven't got an answer to, and I, and I know I'm not meant to sit on the stage up here and say I don't have the answer to this, but I don't have the answer to this, which is, is and Claire's talked about it as well, which is what do you do with bad actors? What do you do with somebody who's in the process acting in a way that is not authentic? They're not authentically seeking uh, an, an outcome from the process that the outcome that the process is designed to deliver. And I don't really know how we deal with that, other than that sort of social opprobrium that that we might uh, deal deal with that in in, in other cases. Um, there's a sort of metaphor for Twitter that it's like a party. You know, you go into different rooms and people are talking about different things. And I think somebody uh, reworked that to say this is a party where all of the interesting people have left, and now the people who are who, who remain are the people who are shouting their opinions at you. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that's a lot of where we've got with public debate. And some of what I think we need to do is go back to the issues. And I think you know we talk with great affection about people of an earlier generation who I think were more concerned about the issues and less concerned about uh, politics as a spectator sport. And if, if there's one thing I could, I, I could unwind, it's the idea that politics is a spectator sport where you get a, a jersey in the colour of your team and you say that your players are the best players ever and the other team's players are all rubbish. It's an absolutely terrible way to make decisions about things. We need to focus back on what the issues actually are, not on whose team is winning and whose team's losing. And just one, one final thing in, in relation to what, what, I, what I think we've been, we've been talking about before, which is I often feel that politics now looks... To succeed in politics, you have to go through what is a, a, analogous to a trial by fire. You have, it, it feels like the people wanting to participate in it are uh, having to hold on to a burning iron, and the person who holds on longest gets, gets to su succeed, and then people wonder why you don't get normal people in politics. Uh, and, and the answer is because you, you've put them through this process, or a traumatising process. We need to stop that. We need, to, we need to focus, I think, on the issues. We need to focus on who it is can advocate well on the issues rather than uh, this sort of trial by, by fire or trial by, by media very often. As one of the abnormal survivors who's still holding on to the um, burning iron, any, any reflections on, yeah, I mean, on it, it, I mean that, that's very about trying to get people to go into politics and, a, mm. and, a, and a, you know you do when you meet pretty you meet people in, in in voluntary and community sector who you know would be brilliant and people who immediately go I wouldn't go near it mm. and it is in very large part and particularly for women um, some of the, the abuse that they, they perceive that they're going to get and that they they, they very often are that question about about bad faith actors is very because as I said at the start I genuinely and I, I was in local government before where you, 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 people do seem to be less, you know, quite well motivated. Basically, it isn't quite, you don't have to be quite such a weirdo, frankly, to, to hang on. You know, people uh, can have a normal life as well and are, are, are by definition quite connected to their community. Um, and, you know, when you're, when you're looking at decisions and you do try and just train your brain, you know, that person hasn't proposed that cut because they want to see children going hungry. They've proposed that cut because they think that the money is better spent here. But that has become very difficult in the last few years. And, and I must say, in a, in a, in a period around about uh, last summer, and, and particularly, again, pertaining to issues um, in, in Northern Ireland and a couple of prime ministers ago, um, I, I, I did increasingly, and I, for me, the last taboo was, I wasn't going to use the word evil, uh, you know, I, I was really, I, I was really trying to find, but I, I, it got to the point, I think last summer, whenever I really, I, I was struggling to participate in debates or in media without you know, without swearing, essentially, without I was I was got, I was finding it very difficult to explain and to try and keep a lid on the anger and the frustration the people I represent um, were, were 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 feeling who were who, who genuinely felt this was a very targeted you know somebody playing with their playing with their lives and you're trying to convey the seriousness of that but without uh, whipping people up. Some of it is around the political structure, the political systems as well, and and it's it in two things. One first past the post and again. And back to that mm. phrase you use, winner takes all, is not is not productive at all. And I mean, um, PRS TV in different you know uh, ways aren't aren't ideal. But if in first past the post in general, you know, if you can, as you say, motivate um, a small maybe thirty percent, forty percent of the electorate, you know, you're you're home in a boat. I represent a, a seat that's that is a four way marginal. In fact, it was a five way marginal, the only five way marginal in the UK, and it is one that four parties in normal elections get in and around a quarter of the vote. 
So I almost, you have to behave in a PR way. You have to basically, you can't piss off too many people. You have to, you have to try and uh, keep a coalition. And that is very, very healthy. But you see uh, in seats where people only have to get their bit of the electorate out. Um, they, they don't have to make so much of an effort. And similarly, actually, uh, political systems that, that encourage coalitions can, um, can, can be, it, it takes out a lot of the opposition for opposition's um, sake. If you look at the Republic of Ireland that actually tends towards coalition, a few years ago, anybody who watches it closely will know that two of the, the two dominant parties, or the parties that had been dominant, dominant for the last century, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, they're quite similar, but they actually had, they went into a confidence and supply situation in I think 2016 and quite quite quickly the noise in politics dropped because they didn't feel that they had to mark each other on every point because they were actually trying to so some of it is about the systems that we use but there are just bad articles in uh, that that in there and I, I wish I knew I wish I knew how to, how to deal with them other than amplifying the people and as I say finding the people in other parties as well that you know are in it for the right reasons and and trying to convey your respect for them and your understanding of where they've come from um, as just a little bit of a way um, to, to, to stop everybody fall, you know, falling into that and, and, and perceiving that the other side doesn't understand my view at all. But, but I, I wish I knew. And unfortunately, some of them are drawn into the light, you know, whether it's, it's, it's the, the thing that can make a lot of money out of it. And some people, it is just pure ego and attention, I suppose. Yeah. Good. Bad actors and abnormal weirdos. I think we're taking self-deprecation to, to, to kind of stratospheric levels. I've got um, a lady next to the gentleman who's just asked the question in the middle row. And then I saw another hand there or thereabout. Um, okay. Thanks, Liam. Um, just as a small point to pick up on Peter, the Parliament was never meant to have First Minister's questions for the very reasons he outlined, um, and it's a great pity we've got them. But there were two things we hoped for with the Parliament. One was that new kind of consensus, the new politics, and the Chamber was meant to represent that. And it's no surprise in some ways, given the global context, that we haven't got as much of that as we liked. But the thing I've been most disappointed by, and it's increasing, you've referred to Liam, is playing the man not the ball. When we set out, this parliament was about the issues, but it seems that it's almost because there's less that divides people on the issues, they have started to personalise it. So we plea to you and your colleagues as presiding officers to maybe start nailing some of that um, bad behaviour and, and name calling, because I think that trust issue and the issue that Sheila raised about young people I brought my children up to criticise behaviour, not the person. And if what they see in Parliament is what they're seeing right now, why on earth in their 20s will they look at their mother and not think she's mad? <laughs> what was she trying to teach them? And one of the things we used to say was this Parliament only offered one threat, and it was the threat of a good example. So for me, the more we can do to bring that civility back to the debate in Parliament, because the committees are invisible to the most of the public. But I do, I do understand the pressures you're under, and I do wonder how much of it you think is about the social media, the 24-hour media cycle, and the fact that our journalists are still behaving as political hacks, not parliamentary ones. So they look for that divisive story rather than report on what's actually happening. So the question is, you know, do you think the media is a big part of that? OK, um, I mean, certainly I, I would I would accept that. Um, I, I, but I think too often um, as politicians, we can blame the media, we can blame social media, but it, it allows us a, a get it a free um, jail card in terms of our own behaviour. And as I say, some of those who are quickest to, to condemn are often the quickest to pull the trigger in terms of their, their own um, fairly kind of vicious attacks. And believe me, in, in terms of playing the man and not the ball in the debate within the chamber, it is relatively easy uh, for somebody who's not terribly creative to look as if they are attacking the ball, not the not the man. Um, and, and I think you go down the route of prescribing language and, and being too interventionist in terms of behaviour at, at, your, at your peril. Um, because as I say, the tolerance of, of, of what is respectful debate is going to differ from one member to another. Um, My I, I think, favourite sneaky line is, I think you're too intelligent to believe what you've just said. Yeah. You know, so it's, you're both playing the ball and the man at the same time. Well, it was, it was Dennis Skinner, wasn't it? Who famously said that half the Tories are liars, um, was, was upbraided by the speaker. Um, asked to apologise and said half the Tories aren't liars. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
So there are, there are ways around it, whether you're creative or not. You use Ulster Scots vernacular. I try to use as much. You know, you're not allowed to call Boris Johnson a liar, but I got away with calling him a spoofer. I don't know if the, the speaker knew what I meant. But... <laughs> I, think, I think this is descending into a tip session. <laughs> yeah. how did, how did it Aim to be helpful at all times, Peter. Um, I, I, I'm conscious of, of, of um, running out of time shortly, so we've maybe got a couple more questions or, or comments. Gentlemen there on, on the far end of the fourth row. Oops. I think that row is definitely winning it in terms of the number of questions. Hi. There's been quite a lot of discussion about uh, promoting more nuanced debate and perhaps uh, longer, more issue-based debate. But how do we maybe encourage um, the average person on the street that doesn't want to devote the time to looking at nuanced issues? Maybe they're not interested, they don't care. How do we uh, perhaps promote engagement and interest among uh, just Joe Blog off the street? Because mm -hmm. uh, that can maybe help encourage better voting choices. When we come to Claire, I mean, there's quite a um, debate at the moment about deliberative democracy and citizens' assemblies, etc., um, for, for trying to find a way of engaging people um, on their terms and, and, and in ways that, that, as you say, kind of engage an interest without requiring them to have a deep-seated knowledge of parliamentary procedure or, indeed, a detailed knowledge of, of, of individual, often quite technical issues. Claire? Yeah, I, I mean, one, it is about realising and, and politics, as you say, it, Peter was making a point about sometimes people want to get a smaller number of people involved, it's about people, you know, feeling comfortable that, that democracy isn't just once every four years, them going in and, and casting the vote and that, that, you know, they should have ways of holding people accountable and that they should, you know, feel confident to turn up. And yes, you're right, dialing down a lot of the process. I know when I was in, when in the council, I didn't open my mouth for the first year because I was terrified that somebody goes standing order, you know, as, as they would and people try and close down debate by basically you know you, you've raised this at the wrong part of the agenda uh, and so on and um, it is on all of us as, as, as politicians that again I wish I had that answer to to figure out ways to communicate better to people I think for the time being and um, the plus the, the it is social media and it is trying to find ways to condense complex stuff um, into into relatively accessible because people either don't have time or necessarily the sometimes the inclination to, to, to read and understand um, a, 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 a little bit more and it is also trying to broaden out um, the number of people who are who are involved in it because I would say um, I'd say far less than one percent of the population is involved in the boring business of democracy. You know, of actually, you know, going out and delivering leaflets and, and knocking doors and trying to persuade people. And that is a is a problem that it is seen seen as something for somebody else. And it's also a problem then when parties go to try and find candidates. They're they're picking from the weirdos. You know, the people who have who have 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 got active in politics. And I think people believe because of the behaviours they see from politicians and political activists, they believe you do have to be that kind of you know total total activist uh, person and people who go well I, I would but uh, I don't think I could do this or I don't think I could be on Twitter seven nights a week or I don't think you know I don't agree with you in 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 one little area so I couldn't be involved in politics I would say to people it's a bit like choosing a partner in life you know you don't have to agree with absolutely you don't you don't have to find the absolutely perfect one you find one close to your values and you spend the rest of your life trying to improve it and and that's <laughs> the same with, with 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 political parties but it is it's just it is it, it constantly see Seeking ways to try and make politics feel a wee bit more normal to people, and that they don't, as I say, it isn't going to be something that can that is necessarily going to become their whole life, and they're not going to have to hate the people in the other party because that just doesn't, you know, it gets the wrong people. I'm trying not to be unsettled by the fact that every time you say weirdos, you turn around and look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila, your your take on getting more people engaged in in that discourse, that debate. I think you know, what Claire says about simplifying complex issues, I mean, people don't have the time or the inclination and in what are usually busy, quite often at the moment, hard lives, and they don't necessarily have that time to devote to it. But I can't help but think that people would be more interested in politics if we didn't see 
politicians just shouting abuse at each other, uh, and whether that's at question time or in the in the chambers, you know. And I'm not picking any particular parliament, but I think that's an issue. People are not encouraged. But I I don't know. I, I mean, it turns me off. I mean, you know, there are times I've stopped watching a lot of the political programmes, you know, even things like Question Time and stuff like that. I used to watch Question Time religiously. How many of you watch it now? I mean, I just, you know, I, I can't bear it. I just sit there shouting at the TV because I'm just like, oh, for goodness You'll sake, you can't say that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is, it is, I think that's frightening. I do think there's an education uh, thing about it. I mean, I've watched one of my daughters, and my husband was involved in one of the constitutional law cases. And and she completely, she's 20, com she's studying politics at university, but she was completely disinterested. What dad did was just dull, you know, like everything mum does is dull. Uh, and she wasn't interested. But somehow, when the whole nation was watching one of those constitutional cases, I'm talking about the prorogation case, he came out on the wrong side. Um, but uh, the, the prorogation case, just caught her interest. Suddenly she wanted to talk to dad about it all the time. She wanted to discuss it in an intelligent, calm way. And something clicked in her. And I watched that and I thought, we can do this. We can get children interested, you know, kind of that was at 15, 16, she's gone on to choose to study politics. She can do this and we can all do this, but we all have a part to play. Every single one of us has a part to play, to talk to our, young people and those that we come into contact with in a measured respectful way about politicians not to buy into the just let's fling abuse about you know whatever we think about individual politicians and i'm sure we'll all have a few that we can't stand but you know if we can behave in that way towards our young people we don't educate them to behave properly and to think about it properly and to actually have a debate whether it needs more formal than that whether or not we should have more you know lessons in schools about uh, about politics and, and about civic society I mean that probably is one of the few things that I suspect America does better than we do there's not many things but in that category but I do think that they do that quite well I've got a very good friend whose daughter has spent her last five years in the education system in America and it's been quite noticeable how much more engaged she's ages with my children but she's much more engaged in it because that is something they teach maybe we need to look at that but I just I, I think we all have a big part to play in this it's because it is otherwise it's never going to change and that's not good Thank you. Peter, I'm going to give you a quick opportunity to jump in with um, some very brief thoughts on this because we then need to move to the, the wind-ups. Yeah, so, so I, I think part of the problem is, uh, in, in your question you ask how do, how do we get people in, in, interested in politics, I don't really think we need people to be interested in politics. What we need people to be interested in is how decisions are made and I think we need to give people more chances to participate in the making of decisions. And I think, you know, teaching classes in school is, is, is a good thing actually giving students at school the opportunity to make some decisions would be a really good thing to do, giving them uh, the, the right to decide over, over some things. And I think, you know, citizens' assemblies and deliberative democracy is really great because it's a structured process where you say, these are the issues, here's the evidence. You can hear from all of the people who have done work on this, you can hear their opinions, and you can then make a decision. And in the Republic of Ireland, they had two fantastic citizens' assemblies, one on abortion and one on equal marriage that solved a couple of problems that the, that the politicians have been trying to solve for 30 years and couldn't. They've had a series of citizens' assemblies since that have been less successful, and I think that's, that's really interesting as well. But giving that delegated uh, decision-making power on, on tough issues is the way in which to get people involved, because people don't have to be involved or interested in politics, but everybody is interested in issues. Everybody's interested in making decisions about things that affect them, that they know about, and that's what we should be aiming to do. Some of those have to be taken at quite a high level, and that's why I think we, we'll still need representative democracy, but the problem is that representative democracy has filled down into a lot of decisions that don't need to be made in that way, and where we could get people to do that really sensible debate about something that, that matters to them. Good. Thank you very much. And a quick plug for the work of um, the, the committees that have been lauded. Um, the Citizens Participation and, and Petitions Committee is currently undertaking an inquiry on that issue of deliberative democracy and how you dovetail that with an elected democracy. So you give Parliament its place alongside um, that sort of process of, of engaging meaningfully with, with, with people. Right. Um, we've reached the end of the questions. I'm going to ask each of the panellists, um, you have a minute each. Uh, to, to sum up how we um, disagree agreeably. I'm going to stick pretty rigidly to those timeframes and I'm going to kick off with you, Sheila. 
I'm encouraged. I think there's, I, you know, I, I'm delighted to see so many faces here today that people are interested in this topic. And I think that gives me some hope uh, that uh, we can fix this. Um, I think it's incredibly important that we do learn to be respectful and we remember that our own behaviour teaches those who come behind us. And I think that it is encouraging that I seem to be sensing a, a positive reaction to uh, the idea that maybe we have to work harder, all of us. I mean, we're a small group, but I just think it's incredibly important that we do that. I worry for our future if we don't start to address this and start to work back from where we are at the moment, because it doesn't seem to me that we're heading in a direction that is particularly helpful for society as a whole. Thank you so much. Claire. I have the advantage here that I operate somewhere else and none of you know me, so you, I can pretend like I'm an exemplar of good behaviour, so don't ever like watch, turn on the TV and watch me like calling somebody all the names of the day or something, but I, which I, but I, I do think they're, 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 it, is, it is in all of us to kind of stick to your values, by the way, and I don't think finding consensus has to mean that everybody's a blamange shade of brown in the middle, you know, you, you, can, you can be very firmly who you are, and I think actually people want that, I, mean, I know in the, in the, where I operate people People, you say, look, I'm a, I'm a centre-left, you know, um, pro-New Ireland politician. You can get votes. You know, you're, you're not trying to pretend you're something um, that, that, that you're not, but you're going for, and I think the best tip that I got from, from somebody who'd been in, at this longer than me was, try and get try and go for the best part of your opponent's argument you know and, and that they are your opponent by the way you're not they're not your enemy but don't kind of pick the low-hanging fruit and the bit where you can turn their words on them and kind of make an agent out of them try and tackle the substance of their argument to the, to the best uh, extent uh, that you can and as i say try to amplify um the, the good actors um, that are out there because it does sometimes feel like a, a, a losing battle because sometimes it feels like there aren't consequences to real terrible charlatans can can, can can get elected and, and potentially get elected from jail and I'm not talking about Peter I think we all know who I'm talking about but um, but, but 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 it is yeah it's just it's it's be it being who be, being who you are finding the good in others trying to find the best in 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 their motives and not getting um, too sucked into the the cut and thrust of it yeah. now, Peter after that character endorsement from Claire. Any thoughts? Oh, I'm hoping the jail isn't coming too soon. Uh, so I think, I think the first thing is we need to ask the politicians to allow people to make more decisions where it's, where it's appropriate to delegate more, more, more responsibility to people, to have more of those uh, participatory processes. Secondly, I think we as people uh, need to stop uh, allowing ourselves to be wound up by people uh, shouting on social media and uh, generating that, that energy. I, I think, thirdly, uh, we, we need to find ways in which uh, to, to really assess evidence and assess different approaches in, in, a, in a serious way in all of those processes. And fourthly, I think we should rename it Twitter and ban the discussion of anything on there apart from birds. <laughs> <laughs> or Harry Staff. Yeah. Look, thank you very much, and thank you so much for your participation. <laughs> a couple more thank yous and a couple of promos as well. Can I thank again the John Smith Centre for their partnership um, in today's event? Thank our BC, uh, BSL interpreters, Shoma Dixon and Heather Graham, again for their hard work. take the opportunity of a shameless plug. Um, there are many more uh, events in the festival the next couple of days. Um, I would uh, make reference to Cheap Food and Mental Health at 4pm today and Women of Colour in Politics and Challenging Racism uh, due at 6.15. Well, tomorrow we'll have an in conversation uh, with uh, broadcaster and former politician Michael Pertillo and a panel on talking to boys and men about gender-based violence. So uh, a pretty eclectic but fascinating mix of topics due, um, to be uh, discussed over the next couple of days. But finally, can I ask you uh, again to put your hands together for our three panellists, Peter, Claire, and Peter. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you.